Nations people who were separated from their land, the law, the culture, and their children. We accept with gratitude the generous offer, now five years old, of sharing in the journey toward a new way of living and sharing in this land. Maybe this is fifth anniversary and a turning point. Wouldn't that be fantastic? In which case, let's remember this day and this date. This evening, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Deirdre Palmer, and we especially welcome you, Deirdre, tonight. And we welcome Laurie and Joanna as well. Thank you for coming. And Deirdre will address herself to the issues of ethics and its source, freedom, love, justice, peace. I think we can go that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> We've just covered it. At the heart of Christian ethics is the call to embody God's vision of our world, seen so fully expressed in the life, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus as the Christ. In this session, we will be exploring the source of this passionate commitment, its biblical and theological foundations, and the praxis of the United Church in Australia. We will be invited to reflect on the source of our own engagement, and we will explore narratives of hope which sustain our actions for love, justice, liberation, and peace. Now, just in case you're one of those people who's been living under a rock and don't know Deirdre, <laughs> Deirdre has served as President of the United Church in Australia from 2018 to 2021. Have you got your breath back yet? Yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> when her theme was abundant grace, liberating hope. She continues to listen for narratives of liberating hope and believes the church is at its best when its community life and engagement in the world is shaped by generous hospitality and the abundant love of God. Deirdre is a renowned educator, having taught at the Adelaide College of Divinity, the Uniting College, and further afield at Perkins School of Theology in Dallas, Texas. And as a social worker, Deirdre previously worked with Uniting Communities as part of their Childhood Sexual Abuse Counselling Team, and that was pr prior to becoming the moderator of the Synod of South Australia. Deirdre, we're very pleased that you're here to speak with us tonight. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Janine, and thank you for the invitation to be with you this evening. And I've talked to a couple of you, and I think you've been in a really interesting series reflecting on uh, the interface between religion and ethics, so I'm looking forward to sharing with you tonight. I'm also told that you're used to talking to one another, yes, so there will be opportunities uh, throughout the night for you to reflect on what you're hearing as well. Um, as uh, Janine has indicated, uh, I believe that the heart of Christian ethics is the call to embody God's vision for our world. And this vision is expressed in the incarnation, in the life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Christian communities around the world right now are acting for justice, calling for liberation and working for peace as they follow the way of Christ who calls for the flourishing of all people and of the creation. As we gather tonight, I also want to acknowledge the Ghana people, the sovereign first peoples of the land on which we are gathering. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and to their emerging leaders. I recognise their continuing culture from time immemorial, and I commit to walking together on the path of justice, voice, truth, and treaty. And I would reflect also with Janine. It wasn't it wonderful that the first thing that came out of our new Prime Minister's mouth was that we're going to honour the Uluru State yeah. from the heart. Well, ethics. Ethics is the discipline, and you've probably heard various definitions of ethics over these four weeks, but ethics is the discipline that focuses on the way we live our lives in the world. The vision, the values, and the virtues that shape us. Our understanding of ourselves, our engagement with our neighbours and with the whole creation. And the vision, the values and the virtues that shape our decision making personally and communally. I recommend to you this book, um, An Introduction to Christian Ethics by Robin Lovin. Uh, he was the Dean at Perkins School of Theology when I was working there and teaches a course on ethics. And he uses the idea of goals, duties and virtues when we think about Christian ethics. I'll be reflecting on the source of, of, ethics, of ethics from my context of a Christian ethic shaped by the Uniting Church in Australia. And I'm going to invite you to reflect on the vision, the values and the virtues that shape your way of being in the world. As an entry point into this conversation, I'm going to invite you to look at the opening part of the document, Our Vision for a Just Australia. Those of you who are watching online, it's accessible through the Uniting Church Assembly website, uniting.church. And those of you who are sitting before us, uh, Joanna's going to distribute a copy of it uh, so you can actually look on it, but I'm also going to put something up on the board. So this vision statement is a collaboration of people engaged in working for justice advocacy through the mission and ministry of the Uniting Church in our synods, through our agencies and through the assembly. And it's inspired by the work of the Australia Remade Project, which happened a number of years ago, involved listening to over 200 Australians as to what they hoped for Australia and for the public good. In this document, we've named our hopes in seven foundational areas and identified why these are important to us as followers of Christ and members of the Uniting Church. The first version of this was produced back in 2019, and then we produced another version in 2020 when COVID had significantly hit, and it's called Build Back Better. I know that's another slogan in another place. <laughs> but it's called Build Back Better, a just recovery post COVID-19. This updated version that some of you have in your hands 
uh, it was released in July 2021, and it was a resource leading up to the federal election and for our ongoing engagement in the public space. Articulating our vision for Australia at this time is critical. Many of the issues identified in this document are prominent in public debate as Australians consider the future that they want for our country. And no greater time than when politicians have just been freshly elected, this is our opportunity to, to hold them to the promises they've made. For each foundation, you will find helpful questions for personal reflection that might prompt discussion. And there are also questions that you might use to engage with community leaders. So we're going to, I'm going to read to you the document. Uh, it's not very long and in several parts. So our vision for a just Australia. We see a nation where each person and all creation can flourish and enjoy abundant life. The United Church in Australia believes that the whole world is God's good creation. Each person is made in God's image and is deeply loved by God. Now you can hear now, we'll, we'll unpack this as we go along, some of the biblical and theological foundations that undergird this particular vision. Each person is made in God's image and is deeply loved by God. We hear echoes of that, of course, in the creation story. Our vision, grounded in the life and mission of Jesus, Our vision, grounded in the life and mission of Jesus, is for a nation which is... It's not, it's not, not changing. Could just give me the... Oh, there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good, good. Our vision, <clears throat> grounded in the life and mission of Jesus, is for a nation which is characterised by love for one another, of peace with justice, of healing and reconciliation, of welcome and inclusion. A vision which recognises the equality and dignity of each person and recognises coexistent sovereignty of First Peoples, has enshrined a First Nations voice and is committed to truth-telling about our history. It's a vision that takes seriously our responsibility to care for the whole of creation, is outward-looking, a generous and compassionate contributor to a just world. A succinct but a very dense statement on our vision for a just Australia, <coughs> driven, uh, derived from the scriptures, from theological foundations, from decisions that the Uniting Church has made over its history, discerned in communal contexts. Flowing out of this vision are seven foundations. The first is a first people's heart. In this foundation, we affirm the sovereignty of First Peoples and importance of them having a voice in the, in the decision-making of our country and are living out their right to self-determination. The second foundation is renewal of the whole creation. Our vision for the renewal of God's creation, addressing the impacts of climate change and working for a sustainable future for the earth. The third foundation is a welcoming, compassionate and diverse nation. This picks up our vision of valuing our diversity of cultures, of languages and faiths and experiences. And it's about welcoming people who seek refuge and treats them fairly. An economy for life, some of you may recognise this, is that there's an assembly, assembly document called an economy of life. It, it unpacks where economic decisions are made on the basis of what serves the well-being and flourishing of all people and lifts people out of poverty and fairly shares our country's wealth. And this is going to be even more significant as we continue to respond to COVID and uh, emerge from it. The fifth vision is an inclusive and equal society where we live together in a society where all people are equal and free to sex exercise our rights equally regardless of faith, cultural background, race, ability, age, sexual orientation and gender identity, and that we defend the rights of all. And you may know that the Uniting Church has advocated for a Bill of Rights or a Charter uh, for quite a long time, and we had significant submissions in the last um, to the, on the Religious Discrimination Bill in this area. 
The sixth one is flourishing communities, regional, remote and urban. In communities all over Australia, from our big cities to our remote regions, we seek the well-being of each Australian and uplift those who are on the margins. And you may be familiar that the Uniting Church has many congregations, as some of you others from other Christian traditions, in rural communities where they're on the ground responding to the issues and needs of rural communities. We have bush chaplains working with Frontier Services and Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress with significant impact in remote communities. Because they're only remote if you're not living there. We don't usually use that word. Um, the seventh one is contributing to a just and peaceful world so that we are a nation that works in partnership with other nations to dismantle the structural and historical causes of violence, injustice and equality, and our government upholds human rights everywhere. So that's a very brief overview. There's the, there's the overarching vision for a just Australia and then these seven areas flow out of that. So the resource that you're holding in your hand or you can see online actually goes into much greater detail on that. But I thought this is a good entry point for us to talk about ethics and its source. So we're going back to the vision and uh, the reason why you've got a piece in your hand is because that's very, very tiny to be able to fit it all in. So those of you who are online, I hope you can access the, uh, the assembly website to find the document. But what I'd like you to think about now is when you look at this vision, I want you to reflect on the, your own vision that shapes your living in the world. And it may be that when you look at that vision you think, yes, there's significant parts of the vision that shapes my life. And then the other question is, what is the source of that vision for you? You know, there are many people in Australia who would include parts of these as their vision for what it means for us to be a just Australia, um, for the common good, for the flourishing of all people and all creation. So I'm going to invite you probably in groups of three, because I think that means that people get an opportunity to speak. You can be in pairs if you'd rather that. Um, to spend about uh, 10 or 15 minutes reflecting on what is the vision that shapes your way of living and acting in the world, and what is the source of that vision for you? Does that make sense? Yes. Right. Okay. So if you want to take 10 or 15 minutes uh, to talk to one another and you know, introduce yourselves if you don't already know yourself. Thank you. 
about two more minutes, so perhaps finish this paragraph you're speaking. source of ethics. For, for Christians, one of the core sources are the Christian narratives that arise from Scripture. So throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, we find witnesses to God's concern that God's people work for justice, wholeness and reconciliation among all people in God's world. Our action in the world for justice particularly with the poor and oppressed, is because we are participating in God's mission in the world. The God we worship is a God of justice and compassion, who stands with the poor and marginalised of our world and offers God's love and grace to all. God who calls us to love God with all our being and love our neighbour as ourselves. And the, some of the overarching themes in the narratives of Scripture speak of the nature of God. And you'll understand as I talk about scripture, we're not talking about a literalist or a fundamentalist view of scripture. It's, a, it's, it's seeing there, understanding the context, bringing interpretive tools, and seeing the broader picture of scripture. When we think about the nature of God, of course we could spend weeks and weeks or years or a lifetime talking about that. Um, but, you know, we see God as creator, God as liberator, freeing the people from slavery in the story of the Exodus. We see God as sanctuary. My background, as Janine was saying, is as a Christian educator and some of the African-American educators I work with say this idea of God as sanctuary, God as refuge, and God as liberator was so core uh, to the identity of African-American people. We also see the narratives woven throughout the scriptures of sin and brokenness, however we name that, which has alienated us from God and from each other. And the offer of reconciliation and redemption is spread throughout the scriptures. In my own formation as a child and as an adult, I've been blessed by those who have shared with me their experience and understanding of God as love, compassion, Hope, a God who is hospitable and inclusive and forgiving. The God who in Jesus we see widening the embrace of love to all. Jesus who extends the table and invites everyone to the feast. And, and we know for some people that is not the God they have encountered um, through the various religious traditions, through our own Christian traditions. So I'm deeply grateful for those people who nurtured me in their understanding and faith. 
As I read the Gospels, one of the key aspects of Jesus' life that moves me and invites me to grow deeper in my Christian discipleship is Jesus' compassion. The compassion that lies at the heart of who God is. One of the definitions of compassion is to notice the suffering of another and to take action to alleviate that suffering. And we see throughout the scriptures that Jesus notices people's suffering. One of the iconic texts for me when I was working in counselling was, was the bent over woman. Here's a woman for 18 years has been burdened, oppressed, and Jesus notices her in the synagogue that day. He notices her and he goes toward her and touches her and her life is transformed because of that encounter with Jesus. She sees the world differently. Her horizons are stretched because of that encounter with Jesus. And there may be other iconic stories for you and narratives in scripture that shape your ethics, the way you are living and acting in the world. Jesus sees the suffering of a father pleading for Jesus to heal his daughter, the suffering of a man tormented by what the Bible names as demons, and the suffering of a whole people. We know this is not just a personal picture. This is about a people who are oppressed by the occupation of foreign powers. We hear the compassion of Jesus as he announces the program of justice and healing that marks his ministry. And of course, another iconic text for us is Jesus' announcement of the program of his ministry in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through to 21. You're probably familiar with the words. Jesus takes the a reading from the Hebrew prophets, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He's taking it from Isaiah. And he's come to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus' Jewish listeners were hearing from their own context of being occupied by a foreign power and they understood also the context of the people in Isaiah's time who were being spoken to shortly after the Babylonian exile. Luke describes that in the ministry of Jesus through the power of the Spirit, those who are vulnerable and living in difficult circumstances will be liberated. Their eyes open to a new life under God through God's transforming activity. Now throughout the Gospels, we hear Jesus proclaiming that the kingdom of God is coming among us. And I would argue that this vision for a just Australia is a vision of the reign of God, the commonwealth of God, the king kingdom of God. In Jesus' life and ministry, we see a continuity with the Hebrew tradition. His life and ministry are a proclamation of the reign of God. He continues at the Hebrews before him to talk about the kingdom as both present and future. The discontinuity with his own Hebrew tradition as if he claims the reign of God has arrived in his person, work and ministry. And this reign of God calls for personal conversion and social transformation. Gustavo Gutierrez in A Theology of, Re of Liberation reminds us that when we read the scriptures that injustice is incompatible with the kingdom of God. As the disciples heard and saw Jesus living out the reign of God, they sought to live out Jesus' healing and liberating ministry through their lives. And of course the church today as that community who are followers of Jesus also seek to live out Jesus' healing and liberating ministry. And we recognise that we are called to be signs of God's love in the world, signs of God's reign. And we know that theologically that reign of God is not some other worldly thing. It is, it is here but not yet. That live, we live in the tension of the reign of God being present among us and yet to be fully realised. Now these scriptural narratives are the foundations for the vision that shape our ethics and I would call them narratives of hope. There have been times in our Christian tradition where we have perpetrated narratives of harm and that's another conversation. Um, in Her Own Time is a wonderful book that talks about the narratives of hope and narratives of harm that are, um, that are upheld by the Christian tradition. Some of the narratives of hope in scripture I've already named. Um, new life out of death in this Easter season. 
uh, God's justice prevailing. The prodigal son is an iconic story that speaks of the abundant and generous love and forgiveness of God. Paul's letters which talk about nothing separating us from the love of God. Now Nelson Mandela is one who's inspired many of us and in his writings and in his proclaiming, when he was released and, uh, in the 1990s and went to New York City, he preached in New York and this was what he said. This day and this occasion under these circumstances would be utterly impossible except for the truth that there is a God who presides over the affairs of history, who vetoes the schemes of evil people, and who decrees that truth crushed to the ground shall rise again. Nelson Mandela went on to quote the words from the prophet Isaiah. We have risen up as on wings of eagles. We have run and not grown weary. We have walked and not fainted. And finally, our destination is in sight. Those kinds of narratives of hope have sustained people over the centuries. And there are narratives of hope that sustain and guide us in our living. At the height of uh, when COVID started to uh, unravel a lot of what we were doing and engaged in, I invited the, the moderators to share in this document, it's what sustains us, and they shared what are the narratives of hope that are sustaining them in this time, and invited people, what are the narratives of hope that are sustaining you? And some of them were, you are not alone, remember who you are, abide in Christ's love, a God who suffers with us and comes to us in our suffering. Now, I'm going to invite you to think about the narratives of hope that sustain and guide you in your living. And they may be ones that come from scripture, they may be ones that parents passed on to you or educators passed on to you or the Christian community that were part of, that they became stories that sustained you um, and, and were a part of your ethical uh, way of being in the world. So I'm going to invite you with the same group uh, to, to think about what are the narratives of hope that sustain and guide you in your living? That are shaping your ethics, that are shaping your way of living and acting. Is that, is that clear? Is that clear?
hearing those narratives of hope from one another and maybe heard new narratives of hope that might actually shape your way of being in the world as well. Now, because another source uh, for our ethics is our theological foundations, which we've already been touching on in looking at scripture. And um, such theological foundations as we are created in God's image. And when we see one another through that lens, that we're all created in God's image, it shapes our interactions with one another. We're invited to treat one another with respect and dignity and love and compassion. Also, the Christian tradition has many historical documents that we won't be going through today. Oh. <laughs> so if you didn't want to sleep tonight. <laughs> Um, but for the United Church, the basis of union uh, is, a, is a significant historical document for us. And you will have seen in the expression uh, in the Vision for a Just Australia talking about the reconciliation and renewal of the whole creation as we participate in God's mission. That's just one of the significant uh, theological foundations for the United Church. You may also be familiar with the statement to the nation uh, that was issued in 1977. 
and which, which under, underlines the importance of a holistic gospel that engages with the world around us. Charles Curran is another Catholic moral theologian, and you may be interested in his work, and Robin Lovin touches on, uh, on him and his book. Um, and, and Charles Curran talks about some of the key themes for Catholic moral theology, which is also what we share, uh, it, it's creation and sin, incarnation, redemption and resurrection destiny. Now this symbol up here, Abundant Grace, Liberating Hope, is um, each assembly and each president is uh, encouraged to choose a theme and that's approved by the Assembly Standing Committee. And this is the one that I chose for our 15th assembly. And the reason why I chose it, because I knew we were going into an assembly where we would be making difficult decisions together. Uh, and as I reflected on it, I thought the focus on abundant grace was so important for us. That when we even, even saying the word abundant grace, it kind of suggests a generosity of spirit, um, the overwhelming and overflowing love of God as we come together in Christian community. And as that abundant grace forms us and shapes us, it liberates hope in us and in the world around us. And um, so that I think that can be a significant theme. But all of us have those kind of theological foundations that are shaping our way and of being in the world and with one another in community. Some of the other people, <coughs> some of the other parts that shape our ethics are some of the, the heroes and saints of our faith. And you may have your own, I certainly have mine. Rosemary Radford Ruther only died this past week. She was a significant feminist ethicist. Um, Beverly Wildhorn Harrison, who I'm going to be quoting in a minute. Dorothy Day, uh, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Martin Luther King Jr. James Cone, African American theologian. Uh, Ginny Inni Gondara, who is uh, an Aboriginal theologian, First Nations theologian here in Australia. All of these provide us with theological foundations and experiences of God in the world. And Dorothy Day got into all kinds of trouble during her life. Uh, she's a remarkable woman and she emphasises this holistic gospel that we're called to live out God's call to justice and liberation in the world. And she says, if religion has so neglected the needs of the poor and of the great mass of workers and permitted them to live in the most horrible destitution while comforting them with the solace of the promise of a life after death when all tears shall be wiped away, then that religion is suspect. Yes. <laughs> and Martin Luther King Jr. This sits in our dining room and um, Martin Luther King Jr., who of course was a great inspiration, um, a, a Baptist pastor, an amazing civil rights leader, says this, any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and women and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, their economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry as dust religion. Again, the call for us to be living that ethic of justice and liberation in the world around us. This will also mean that our moral decision making as Christians will be informed by other disciplines. When you read through our vision for a just Australia, you know it's important that we draw from science and psychology and politics and sociology, anthropology, cultural analysis to actually inform, inform our engagement in the world. A very good example of that, and we won't go into that now, is the ethics of vaccination in the midst of a global pandemic. My, I live with two medical people, in the, and we, we've had many of those conversations. Uh, the other area that I think informs our uh, ethical being in the world is our experience of God, our experience of the world and others. And when you have a look at some of the ethics that have emerged over the last couple of decades, you will see that they build on people's experience. So feminist ethics, informed by women's experience. Liberation ethics, shaped by the context of what they would call the underside of history, the untold history, the perspective of the poor. James Cone's work in black theology and the experience of African Americans, where he talks about 
God says I'm somebody when the world says I'm nobody. And First Nations theologians, the understanding of God, the Creator and the Spirit present in this land from the beginning. This kind of theology informs the preamble to the Constitution of the Uniting Church, where it talks about the Spirit being present in creation from the very beginning. Uh, so the source of our ethics is experience, is also relationship. Relationship with God, with our neighbour and with the earth. Our ethics is not simply a set of beliefs or values that are disembodied. This is the power of the incarnation, incarnational presence. And this attention to particular experiences and contexts have brought new issues and <coughs> new insights and challenges to our vision, our values and our virtues. And an example of this is the feminist reflection on the raising up of sacrifice as a virtue. And I want to read from Beverly Wilde and Harrison. It's an excellent uh, piece that she wrote on the power of anger in the work of love. She says, and I haven't got it all up there, but most of it is there. Jesus was radical, not in his lust for sacrifice, but in his power of mutuality. Jesus' death on the cross, his sacrifice, was no abstract exercise in moral virtue. His death was the price he paid for refusing to abandon the radical activity of love, of expressing solidarity and reciprocity with the excluded ones in his community. Sacrifice, Harrison says, I submit, is not a central moral goal or value or virtue in the Christian life. Radical acts of love, expressing human solidarity and bringing mutual relationship to life are the central virtues of the Christian moral life. Yeah. That we have turned sacrifice into a moral virtue has deeply confused the Christian moral tradition. Like Jesus, we are called to a radical activity of love, to a way of being in the world that deepens relations, embodies and extends community, and passes on the gift of life. I deeply appreciate that perspective and you can imagine for, from a feminist perspective where women have been told they nurtured in sacrifice, they need to sacrifice themselves, um, upholding the ethic of love, the virtue of love can significantly transform people's lives. Now the third one I'm going to very quickly touch on, um, if we talk about vision and values, I also want to talk about virtues. There are discussions in ethics about being a good person. This comes in the discussion of virtues and of character formation. And as an educator, I'm particularly interested in processes of formation. Formation in our families, formations in our communities, uh, and, and, and spiritual formation. But character formation, um, in Christian communities shaped by a worldview that is shaped by love. And of course, we're familiar with the fruits of the spirit. And these are virtues of love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there are various references throughout scripture about the character of Christian communities. Philippians is one of those. Robin Lovin in his book says that the emphasis on finding the right rule which has dominated ethics since Kant may not be telling us what we really want to know. Perhaps we cannot know what we ought to do unless we know what kind of people we want to be. The answer to that question is usually stated in terms of personal characteristics that we associate with a good person, compassion and persistence for example and also a capacity for balanced and appropriate decisions that is usually called prudence. These characteristics are virtues and their place in ethics goes back well before the beginnings of Christianity. Uh, he also talks about Augustine and the, the cardinal virtues of temperance, courage, prudence and justice and then Thomas Aquinas adds the three theological virtues of faith, hope and love. Robin Lovin goes on to comment about virtues. The new moral problems that people face today 
raise questions about systems of ethics built on goals and rules. Christian ethics has begun to speak less of right and wrong, measured by goals and rules, and more about responsible human action, which can also be understood in light of the Christian traditions about virtue. Different virtue, versions of the Christian stance, however, have different ideas about how we acquire these virtues and which virtues are important. That could be another debate we have until late into the night. Each of these ways of thinking can help to, to provide a responsible interpretation of events that guide us to the right choice of action. What we need is a kind of virtue that gives us the habit of choosing the right way to think about the problem at hand. We hope that in Christian communities, in our relationship with God, we're developing these habits of turning to the other, of thinking about others. Um, there are multiple examples in relation, for instance, to Australian aid, which highlight some of this, but I'm not going to go into it all. The United Church was involved with a number of other groups on an End COVID for All campaign that highlights some of the issues around people's um, turn toward the other. But I'm going to um, finish very quickly with, uh, with some of my uh, conversation with young adults I had in the Uniting Church during my time as president, because they highlight for me the power of being formed in a Christian community uh, that, that is committed to justice and a holistic gospel. So over the past three years, as I've served as president, uh, I've met with a number of young people, probably about, um, well, formally, uh, just over 100 in relation to this conversation, but many others. And I hosted what I called around the table gatherings. Many of these young people have been formed in the life of the church, and in particular, the Uniting Church. And their vision of the world and experience of living the way of Christ has been shaped by the key themes of the Uniting Church and their engagement in the public space. Now, of course, this is not exclusive to the United Church, but I'm coming from this lens. These are just photos of some of them. Mm. That was before COVID, and I just want to reassure you. <laughs> these, in my interviews with them, I asked them a number of questions, and these were some of the key themes that continue to emerge. And when you have a look at our vision for a just Australia, you'll see echoed in some of this, um, some of the responses of these young adults. They, um, they really understood that every person is created in the image of God and infinitely loved and valued and respected. They were very respectful of one another. They understand every member ministry, that all of us are called to engage in the mission of God in the world. It's not something that special people do or people that have a particular emphasis on justice do. It's actually all of us engaged in ministry and mission. They also are very much committed to the equality of women and men. And we know that this is a, a difficult issue across the Christian tradition. But in the Uniting Church, um, they've been formed that women and men are equal. And as I referred to Rosemary Bradford Lisa, it's very, it's very interesting that, you know, and I did my PhD in a Catholic university, um, some of the best theologians and biblical scholars uh, are those Catholic femin feminist ethicists and theologians who have, it's been born in their struggle and their pain, and they have gifted us as the community, the whole Christian community, this amazing, feminist theology. Of course, there are other Protestant traditions as well. We also are in a covenant of uh, the holistic gospel that we've talked about, that we're in a covenant relationship as first and second peoples, and that we are a multicultural and intercultural church. So arising from these foundations, these young people are passionate followers of Christ, embodying the love of Christ in their families, their schools, their workplaces, their wider community networks, and are passionate advocates for God's vision of justice, peace, and reconciliation for our world. Now, I did these roundtable conversations to inform the Uniting Church, and, um, and I included it as part of my um, presentation to the assembly, because we wanted to hear from young people how they think the Uniting Church should engage in the public space. What are their hopes for the Uniting Church? What are their contributions? 
So these are just some of the responses. What they, um, they want the Uniting Church to be in the public space is a hospitable and welcoming church. They want us to address the impacts of climate change. And they're comforted by the church community in times of grief and need. They value our covenant relationship with the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress. And of course, some of the young adults I interviewed were First Peoples and are actively involved in leadership in the Congress. Uh, they, this is particularly pertinent during COVID as well, responding to mental health issues, responding to domestic violence and modelling relationships of equality, mutuality and respect, addressing racism, concerns for refugees and people seeking asylum, and hearing the viewpoints and insights of young people. They also expressed a deep appreciation of the inclusivity of the United Church, the importance of friendship and community. I think this speaks so much into how we shape Christian communities. It's a place of welcome and friendship and community, reflecting Christ's love and compassion. And again, critically addressing climate change, concern for mental health, gender-based violence, and alleviating poverty and addressing greed in a local and global context. And having a compassionate, well-informed, prophetic public voice. This is very fascinating because uh, I had several conversations with young people who thought we needed to work harder on having very well-grounded, scientific and well-thought-out of policy asks in relation to politics and advocacy. So that, that was very helpful feedback. And that document seeks to, to go a bit deeper in some of those things. These are some of them, uh, very much involved in climate action, very much involved in 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. I thought it was always hopeful to see them um, and you know who are, who are part of this movement. Uh, I will we'll finish in a minute. Um, a number of weeks ago, or that's last 2020, uh, Michael Maguire, who's a journalist in The Advertiser, um, some of you may not read The Advertiser, but Michael Maguire has some interesting things to say and he had a great interview with uh, Sister Joan Chichester, who was here last week. Um, but anyway, I thought this was a fascinating one for us to hear, not only as people engaged in the life of the church, but in the wider Australian community. At some point, Australia will have to decide what kind of country that we want to be. Can we be a place that allows compassion? Or are we going to continue heading down the path of barbarity? In Matthew chapter 25, between verses 31 and 46, Jesus hands out his guidance to his followers. But the real point is when Jesus tells them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did the message is fairly straightforward. How we treat the most vulnerable in our society reflects on what kind of people we all are. And of course, engaging in Christian ethics, we're, we're engaged with the whole community. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful collaboration uh, between, between various religious faiths in Australia and in the wider community working for the public and the common good. Uh, finally, I'd like to say that, um, that our formation is also happening all the time when we're engaged in personal devotion, in worshipping communities, because our ethics is shaped through preaching that we hear regularly, through the music we sing and hear, through the prayers of the people that we hear, through the education of all ages, through the intergenerational Christian community where we're forming one another, and so I wanted to end with this prayer. This prayer for justice and peace, I think, captures some of what we began with in the vision for a just Australia. This was developed in a, the Asian Ecumenical Women's Assembly that I was fortunate enough to attend uh, in Taiwan in 2019. It's particularly poignant when I think of some of the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan and, and some of uh, what they're going through right now. Uh, but these were a group of 250 women from the Christian Conference of Asia. And this was a prayer that we prayed, and I think uh, it's a good way to end the presentation and to highlight uh, the vision which calls us to live our lives in the world. Grant us, Lord God, a vision of your world as your love would have it. 
A world where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor. A world where the riches of creation are shared and everyone can enjoy them. A world where different races and cultures live in harmony and mutual respect. A world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. Give us the inspiration and courage to build it. God, guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness. God, you have given all peoples one common origin and your will is to gather them as one family in yourself. Fill the hearts of all with the fire of your love and the desire to ensure justice for all our sisters and brothers. By sharing the good things you give us, may we secure justice and equality for every human being and a human society built on love and peace. Through Christ our peace we pray. Amen. tonight at the conclusion of this series I think you've reminded us of foundational things and left us with overarching ideas and challenges thank you I suggest that you consider staying and having coffee and tea so that you have the chance to talk amongst ourselves a little longer and you can do that in here or in the space in there. But consider staying a little longer tonight. <laughs> and before we close, though, uh, just to remind you that we have two months rest <laughs> before we begin again. So keep your eye open up for uh, times to start looking for the next series. If you go to the, the final slides, you'll see some information about the August series. Thank you. You've got the clicker there? Ah, oh, up to us. There it is. Honest to God. Anyone who's old enough to remember, I think that's everybody in the room. Hi. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jess. You are the exception. <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, and Joanna. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't generalise so freely. <laughs> well, you can come along and learn, and we can remember. <laughs> but that should be very exciting, don't you think? Yes. To look back at the origins of much of what we are still struggling with. Yeah. A great breaking open. But right now, let's break and have some supper. Yeah.